Hi folks, welcome to this video on um, uh, translating uh, the foreign statements of a subsidiary company into the domestic currency. Now, in our course, we look at um, two basic methods. Um, we look at two methods that are, uh, that are described to us as um, functional currency being that of the Canadian dollar, meaning that when we translate, um, if the functional currency is the Canadian dollar, which is our domestic currency in this question, uh, we're going to assume that the parent and the sub are integrated. We have different rules for translating parent and subs that are integrated with those that are not. So the, the tell here is that if they tell you the functional currency is the Canadian dollar, then you know the sub is integrated with the parent. So we have to use a specific set of rules to do the translation. Any monetary items like cash, receivables, payables, whether they're current or non-current, doesn't matter. They're translated at the current or spot rate. Any non-monetary items like um, land, building, equipment, they're translated at the historical rate. And any income statement items would also be translated at the historical rate. So you'd have items like depreciation expense, which are related to your non-monetary items like equipment or building. So you can kind of see there's a tie in there. So if depreciation or if equipment is recorded at the historical rate, then we have to use that same historical rate to translate depreciation. So that's why there's a connection between income statement and non-monetary items, both being translated at historical rates. But if you don't have a historical rate, so say for example for sales and purchases, they just tell you they occur evenly throughout the year, or they don't give you historical rates, then you would have to use, as we've indicated here, average rates. And you've also got foreign exchange gains or losses, which will come up um, uh, in your translation process here, and they are going to be included as part of your net income uh, in the subsidiary company's translated income statement. Now, um, you might wonder how do we calculate that for an exchange gain or loss? Well, don't forget, whenever you calculate gains or losses on anything, you're looking at what's changed to create that gain or loss. We took in your intro courses when you were selling fixed assets, you would compare the carrying value of an asset to the cash you're getting for that asset and the difference is a gain or a loss on the sale of the fixed asset. Similarly here, in that, we have to look at some opening position and some closing position to determine is there an exchange gain or loss that's happened. We'll talk more about that in this problem. But the idea is, in our case, because the historical rate is in fact historical, it's not going to change. We look at exchange gains or losses as being calculated by determining any change in our monetary position during the year. Why monetary? Because it's the monetary items that are translated at the current or spot rate and that's the rate that will change. So now, in order to produce uh, translated statements for the sub, uh, I like to start with income statement accounts. Why? Because you're asked to do financial statements translated for the sub. The, even if you didn't have to translate statements, if I asked you to do a set of statements, you'd be doing an income statement first. So I look at all the income statement items and the first one I'm going to look at is the cost of goods sold. Because if you follow the rules here, you'll see that we have opening and ending inventory. Inventory is non-monetary and we've got purchases which are part of income which would be translated at a historical rate if known or an average if not. They didn't give us the average rate for purchases during the year, or sorry, they didn't give us the historical rate for purchases during the year, so we have to use the average rate. So you can see that the cost of goods sold is going to be calculated based on three different rates. One rate for your beginning inventory, which they give you in the question, all right, we're going to use 28 Russian rubles uh, for our rate. And again, um, the reason we do this is that if you look at the additional information in the question, it tells you that we had 525,000 Russian rubles in inventory and it was purchased when the average rate was whatever they gave you. Well, that must have been a year 10 average rate, right? So the idea here is that um, we're not interested in that rate, but that inventory that sits there at the beginning of year 11 must have been purchased by the subsidiary company prior to the parent and the sub becoming related. So you might ask, why do we use this rate? Because that's a rate in effect at the date they became related. Well, we have a rule. 
When we're translating foreign statements to the domestic currency, we never use an exchange rate older than the rate in effect at the acquisition date. So in other words, the historical rate to the consolidated entity would be the rate in effect at the date they became related, regardless of the rate in effect when this inventory was purchased, because the inventory was purchased before they became related. So those rates don't count because the only relevant historical rates would be the rate in effect at the date of acquisition or subsequent to them being related. Any new purchases of inventory or those kinds of things that end up in any inventory. So the idea is you have to make sure that you understand the rules of translation. So we're using 28 as our rate. Now we're taking the Russian ruble amount and dividing it by the rate because we have an indirect quotation and we discussed what an indirect quotation was in a previous uh, chapter. So you might want to go back and get that. Now, the only thing, the other thing is we do know our ending inventory. They gave it to us in the financial statements. It was 357,000 Russian rubles. And we're also told that the rate in effect at the date that that inventory was purchased, if you go to the additional information, is 28.04. So now we have that translated, the ending inventory and the opening inventory. But we don't know purchases, so we have to calculate purchases. Well, first of all, we know what our cost of goods sold is. We know what our beginning inventory is, and we know what our ending inventory is. So I oftentimes say to students, the best way to look at this is to do a cost of goods sold calculation. You know it would be equal to beginning inventory uh, plus purchases less ending inventory. Well, we have our beginning, we have our ending right here, and we're looking for purchases knowing cost of goods sold. So what number... Uh, what number such that when we add beginning inventory to it and deduct ending inventory is going to give us 1,680,000 Russian rubles? Well, if we do that calculation, we're going to get 1.512 million Russian rubles in purchases. And because we don't know the rate in effect at the date each of those purchases was made, we're going to use the average rate for the year, which is 28.09, and that's going to give us 53,827. So we know that our cost of goods sold translated, it's made up of three different rates, 59,845. Now, the other thing we can do on the income statement is to calculate equipment depreciation. That's another income statement item. So now, what information do we have on depreciation? Well, we're told in the question in the additional information that total depreciation expense was 63000 We also know that we bought some equipment during the year, and the equipment, that equipment, had uh, depreciation on it of 25000 so we can work backwards to determine how much equipment did the sub have at the date we became related. Now, regardless of when the sub bought that equipment, they would have bought it before we became related, right? But don't forget, this is an income statement item because we're calculating depreciation expense. And income statement items, we said, would be translated at the historical rate. So the question is, whatever rate was in effect at the date that we bought that equipment, right would have been a year 10 rate or a previous year 11 rate previous to year 11 rate that rate we can't use again because of this rule when we translate foreign statements to domestic currency we never use a rate older than the rate in effect at acquisition date so whatever that rate would have been we don't use it we have to use the rate in effect at the date we became related because the rate used when that equipment on hand was purchased would have had an historical rate that precedes the January 1 year 11 rate, which is when we became related. So we are going to use for our on-hand inventory 28. What rate do we use for the purchase? We're going to use the rate, which is the year 11 rate, because it's after we became related, and that historical rate is 28.18. So if we divide our purchase of equipment plus what we had on hand, again, using the rate in effect at the date we became related, we would get depreciation of 63,000 translated to $2,244. Now, while I'm here, even though they're not income statement items, I decided I would translate equipment and accumulated depreciation on the equipment. 
So how did I do that? Well, the question also told me in the additional information that this equipment I purchased that I know I had 25,000 in depreciation expense on, I bought it, it was 125,000 Russian rubles. We've already established for depreciation we're using historical rate. So we use that same historical rate because this depreciation for the year 11 purchase is on this equipment. So we use that same rate. The, inven the equipment that we had on hand, we used the same method we used to calculate depreciation expense on it. What we did is we looked at the equipment balance in the statements of the sub and we had 483,000 rubles. So that must mean working backwards, we must have at the date we became related equipment that had previously, previously to our purchase date or our um, date we became related, that equipment must have been per, that three hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars three hundred and fifty eight thousand Russian rubles in equipment must have been purchased in year ten or earlier, right? But those rates for year ten and earlier are not relevant to us. The historical rate becomes the rate in effect at the date we became related or later. Because this equipment was purchased earlier than the date we became related, we use the, the, the best historical rate we have which is the rate in effect at the date they became related, again using this rule. When translating statements, we never use an exchange rate older than the rate in effect at acquisition, and this is our acquisition rate. So when we divide these numbers by their appropriate rates and add them up, we're going to get an equipment balance translated at 17222 Again, while we're at it, why don't we calculate accumulated depreciation? So again, because we made our purchase this year, our depreciation expense and our accumulated depreciation on the asset that we just bought, the sub bought, is 25,000. We also know we have accumulated depreciation in total of 168,000. That's given to us in the statements. So if we work backwards, we know that any of this equipment, 358,000 that we had on hand, has accumulated depreciation of 143,000 on it. Translate that at the historical rate, which is the rate in effect at the date they became related because this equipment would have been purchased before year 11, but we want the rate in effect at the date they became related because again, we cannot use a rate that's older than the rate in effect at the date of acquisition. So for us, that's going to be 28. So when we do the translation, we get the accumulated depreciation translated at 5,994. So now, we have a rate for purchases, we have a rate for cost of goods sold and depreciation expense, and you're probably thinking, well, we've got other expenses on the income statement uh, in our question. Yes, we do. And we also know that in those other expenses, okay, the, or those other expenses, we've also got in there depreciation expense. So now what do we know? If we go back to our rules, we know that income statement items are translated at the historical rate. Well, for those other expenses, depreciation expense is part of it. But the rest of the other expenses, we don't have any specific historical rate given to us. So we can see now that when we translate other expenses, it's going to be translated using a combination of different rates. It's going to use the historical rate for depreciation expense, and it's going to use the um, um, average rate when we translate all the other expenses outside of depreciation, right? So when we're translating our other expenses, all right, we're just going to have to be mindful of that, all right? So we'll get to that point now that we're calculating our foreign exchange gain or loss. So I'm going to calculate the um, uh, rate to translate the other expenses uh, when we do our foreign exchange gain or loss. So now, we said that that foreign exchange gain or loss that's going to go into the sub's translated statements we have to calculate it based on any change in our monetary position because non-monetary items are translated at the historical rate. We need to look at the um, uh, change in our net monetary position because it's monetary items that are translated at the current or spot rate. 
So that's going to give rise to any exchange gains or losses. So here's how we do it. They give you, to begin with, your net monetary position to open the period. And notice it's a net monetary liability position. Well, we're not given rates before January 1st, year 11, which is where these monetary, this net monetary liability position would have developed. So we translate that at the rate in effect at the date we became related. And in Canadian dollars, we have monetary liabilities in excess of monetary assets by 36,893. And because it's a net monetary liability position, I put brackets around it. What would change a monetary position during the year? During year 11, and again, we're comparing our opening monetary position to our ending monetary position. So what would have given rise to any changes in that monetary position? Well, anything that would have uh, been settled using monetary assets and liabilities. So you have things like sales, things like purchases, not depreciation, right? Depreciation uh, on the income statement wouldn't change a monetary position because depreciation comes about as a result of changes in a non-monetary position, right? When you buy land or buy equipment, building, those kinds of things, you depreciate them, right? So we need to look at purchases and we're even going to look at equipment purchases because we did buy equipment during the year. We know that was 125,000 Russian rubles, but how would we satisfy our supplier of the equipment? We would normally, when we buy the equipment, we would debit equipment and credit accounts payable. Well, accounts payable is monetary, right? So the act of buying equipment, although equipment itself is a, is a non-monetary item, the act of making the purchase is monetary because the account payable you incur is going to be satisfied with cash. So the idea here is let's look at what changes our monetary position during the year. Well, sales. We know sales of 3.15 million rubles translated at the average rate because they didn't give us the historical rate for every sale. We're going to use the average rate. We purchased inventory. We already did this calculation up here. So this is where you can use what you've already done for purchases. And you know that's translated at 53,827. But you've also know equipment was purchased. And the value of that equipment purchased in Canadian dollars was 4436. So you've got that here when we did our earlier calculation. Now your other expenses, that changes the monetary position. How? Well, don't forget of the 840,000 Russian rubles in expenses, only 672,000 of them are going to be settled with cash or will change a monetary position. So you could have things in here like interest expense, you could have uh, wage expense, any other expenses, anything else that you've incurred, rent expense, whatever it is, right? But utility expense, but the idea is there are some non-monetary expenses in here too, like the 105,000 uh, uh, for depreciation expense on the building. They gave you that in the additional information. They told you that for the building, there was depreciation expense on it during the year of 105,000 uh, Russian rubles. We also know that we had depreciation expense on the equipment of 63,000. That was given to us in the question. They told us that. So we're going to deduct these because this is expense included in the other expense that's uh, happens as a result of a non-monetary item. We know that exchange gains and losses under when the foreign, uh, foreign currency is that of the parent, all right, we know that's going to give rise, um, uh, we have to translate those income statement items at the average rate only because we do not know what the historical rate was for any of the other, what remains of that 840,000. And what remains is six, 700, 672,000. So we divide it by the average rate, which will give us 23,923. Dividends, although dividends aren't on the income statement, we do know that dividends change your monetary position. Because if you declare dividends, even to pay them later, you credit dividends payable, right? If you pay them, once you pay them, if you pay them, you credit cash. So it changes the monetary position. And don't forget, when you're using um, the uh, assumption that the functional currency is that of the parent, 
That means the sub is integrated. So the rules that we use is that any monetary items and dividends would be monetary. They're translated at the current or spot rate. So it's that change in the uh, monetary position that's going to give rise to exchange gains and losses. So we need to include the dividends because they're monetary. And we know the rate in effect at the date those dividends were declared is 2820. So that we're going to divide it by that rate to get 15,957. So if we look at our opening monetary liability position and look at all the things during the year that change that monetary position, which total up to 391,000. So all these changes total 391,000. We wind up with what we call a calculated position here. We calculate our net monetary position to still be a net monetary liability position of 642,000 rubles. And that translates when we add the opening monetary liability position to all our changes in the monetary position, the changes add up to 13,996, we get in total a net monetary liability position translated of 22,897. And you might say, well, how is that helping me calculate an exchange gain or loss? Well, we have to compare this calculated position to what the actual monetary position is at the end of the year. The actual monetary position we can get from the financial statements of the sub. So we're going to look at all its monetary assets, which are ca cash and accounts receivable, and compare that to its monetary liabilities, which are accounts payable, bonds payable, and miscellaneous payables. So our monetary assets add up to 273000 if we deduct all of our monetary liabilities, we get a net monetary liability position of 642,000. You should see that your calculated position in the ruble and your actual monetary position in the, in the ruble should be the same. Why? Because in order to calculate the exchange gain or loss, all we're doing up here is calculating what would our net monetary position be in Canadian dollars if we didn't have that foreign subsidiary doing our work in Russia? What would it have been? What would our net monetary position have been? Because we would have been doing it ourselves. And we learned in a previous chapter that if we were doing it ourselves, we translate all the sales, all the purchases, dividends, whatever, we'd be doing it ourselves. So this calculated position gives you what your monetary position would be if you, the parent, didn't have a sub and you did it all yourself. But we know that's not what we have here. We're going to compare that to the fact that we did have a sub doing it for us. We did have a sub. So because we had that sub doing it all for us, right? We're going to take their monetary position. So we get these amounts right from the sub's statements. And when we get it, we should see whether we did it or the sub did it, our monetary position should be the same. The only difference is because the monetary position is translated at the spot rate, I'm going to take that monetary position that the sub has and I'm going to translate it at the spot rate at the year end, which is 2820. And I'm going to come up with a monetary liability position, which is 22,766. Now that monetary liability of 22,766 is a lesser liability than 22,897. So I have an exchange gain because I had the sub doing my work in the foreign country of 131. So I can now place that in my income statement translated. So the next thing we're going to do in our next video is we are going to translate the income statement of the subsidiary company. So stay tuned.